Wow. Oh, hey there. My name's Ross, and I'm a bit of a nerd for all things nature. So a while ago, I started a passion project called well, nerdy about nature. It began as social media videos sharing cool fun facts and tidbits of wisdom about the natural world and has since evolved in this podcast that you're tuning into here. This project serves as means to inspire, educate, and engage folks with the outdoor world so that we can all become better stewards of it and so that we can all work together to create a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and just future for each and every one of us in this world that we all share. Because nature, it's pretty dang neat, you know? I think we should keep it that way. So come on, let's go get nerdy about nature. Come and take a nature walk with me, we're gonna check out some really cool trees, we're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without, let's go get nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby, nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Ah, hello there, my fellow nerdy friends, and welcome to another episode of the Nerdy About Nature podcast. So a few months ago in the news, at least here in BC, you may have heard or seen articles about uh, open net fish farms being removed from BC waters and thought, wow, that's great. And then not done or heard much since then. Well, as you may or may not be aware, fish farms are one of the biggest threats to our at-risk and endangered populations of wild Pacific salmon that travel all over the ocean from down south to Washington and Oregon up through BC to Alaska. And the fight to get these fish farms fully removed from BC waters is still ongoing, despite what you may or may not have heard in the news. So I sat down with Killian Steffest, who is a marine conservation specialist at David Suzuki Foundation, to chat all about these fish farms, their history, how they came to be, the threats they Opposed to wild salmon and why that matters, and what the future of aquaculture looks like here in BC. It's a great episode, and you're going to learn a lot not only about the aquaculture industry, but what you can do to get involved to help ensure the survival of these awesome anadromous fish that tie us and these ecosystems we all reside in together. So let's get into it. All right, so Killian. Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. You're totally new to it. Um, some recent thing that I've been doing with my guests, because it's the, everybody's first time in these headphones kind of hearing yourself talk, is um, why don't you just go ahead and break them in for me with a nice little beatbox, if you don't mind. A beatbox? Yeah. Oh, wow. I can try that. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear it. See what don't you got. get your hopes up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, nice. I like it. <laughs> Getting some bass. <laughs> get there. some bass in there. Yeah, you know? everybody's got their own style. It's pretty funny. It. <laughs> so, thank you for joining me here today. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you please introduce yourself and what you do? Sure. Uh, so, my name is Killian Steffest. Um, I'm a marine ecologist uh, by trade, and I work at the David Suzuki Foundation as the marine conservation specialist. And how long have you been with David Suzuki Foundation? Uh, four years. And yeah. whereabouts are you from originally? I'm from Germany originally, okay. um, but if you're trying to guess my accent, I, I did uh, my undergraduate and master's degree in the UK and then my PhD in Australia. So um, I've been in Canada for four years. Gotcha. Yep. I was kind of getting at like, where did this love and passion for like ocean stuff come from? Not much ocean in Germany. And no, that's true. But it, it really came from a really early, early childhood vacations in Italy, snorkeling in the Mediterranean. That I was like five or six, and those are one of the most vivid childhood memories I have is just diving into that totally different world. And yeah. And then that led you to school in the UK and then Australia. That's right. Yeah. And you did marine stuff the whole way. In school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was kind of, I don't know if you can guess it from those locations, but I was kind of following the surf a little bit. <laughs> right. Fair enough. <laughs> what, what part of Oz were you in? In Tasmania. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, very yeah. cool. I did a little trip down there. Oh, nice. I lived in Melbourne for a couple of years or yeah, right. Torquay, Janjuk area. Nice. Yeah. It was great. Again, went to school, but <laughs> surf. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> I guess today the main kind of topic, because there's a million topics we could get into with uh, ocean stuff. Um, coming down here, I was thinking, I was like, man, this would have been a perfect place to talk about um, shipping tankers, excessive tanker traffic. Yeah, I mean, given I the mean, background, and yeah, it's hard to to miss, right? Yeah. Um, we'll have to pencil that in for another one. But today, the big thing we wanted to talk about was aquaculture. So that's that's a big thing you've been working on at David Suzuki Foundation. Um, why don't you kind of give me a little bit of a background, or like what is aquaculture? Sure. Um, so 
the most basic definition really is um, aquaculture is the, the rearing or farming of any species of plant or animal um, that lives in water and that can be fresh or, or salt water. Um, and aquaculture really has been a part of human food systems for thousands of years, right? Like I think the oldest f sort of evidence of aquaculture is 6,600 around that years old years ago um, from the Australia actually from the Gundich Mara people um, so there there are these um, these channels that were created by lava flow from a volcanic eruption and they used those to to trap and then rear a uh, short finned eel to kind of um, enhance the natural harvest right so it's kind of um, yeah a very small scale form of aquaculture but it is aquaculture and I, I guess similar to that, um, you had the clam gardens on the west coast of North America, right? Right. I was just going to ask, is shellfish included in the aquaculture kind of Absolutely. umbrella? Yep. Yeah. Um, oysters are a really popular species, for example, that is um, um, reared in aquaculture. And, and clams. And, and that's really what the those clam gardens was about, right? Where indigenous peoples for thousands of years um, build walls along the, the coast here to, to create clam habitat so they could then harvest those clams which is also a form of aquaculture right yeah um for people who are unfamiliar with that because i i know about that do you want to kind of give a a brief how-to sure yeah. sure i mean i'm not the expert pre on yeah, this, yeah but it's pretty fascinating <laughs> it is it is um and uh, so it's essentially building a, a stone wall along the beach um which then traps sand like at low tide that's right and and it, it traps sand um which then creates these very flat beach uh, sandy beach areas and so you would do that on a on a beach that's too slopey for clams or on a rocky coastline that doesn't have any beach at all and then when you have this um sort of flat sandy area that's perfect clam habitat and so you could then um harvest those clams from from the clam garden you created yeah it's such a point it's amazing, yeah. 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 What sort of like aquaculture stuff would people be more familiar with these days? Like, what do you, like what's the average kind of person see that's maybe grown in an aquaculture setting? I mean, obviously, the, today it's the large scale industrial aquaculture that people are familiar with in BC, especially salmon farming. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because globally, the the most important aquaculture species is actually freshwater carp. Really? Which is a really big in Asia. I would have guessed seaweed. It's, it's. I mean, I guess maybe not in like economic value. Like, it's not as expensive of a product, quote unquote, high end. But like, I just figured, like, for scale, like, I know, like, all of Indonesia and Japan is big into like seaweed harvesting. Uh, that's my, what I would have thought. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. It might be that there's still a lot of wild harvest possible, and maybe that's why it's less necessary to augment it with aquaculture. Uh, seaweed farming is definitely a big thing, and has been since like the 1600s when they first started in Japan. Um, shrimp uh, is another really big one that's all over South uh, East Asia. Um, I think more than half of the shrimp we eat around the world is from farms. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And uh, so you, you have plants, you have seaweeds, you have fin fish in forms of salmon and carp, uh, and you have shellfish like oysters and mussels and clams. Yeah. And, and mussels would be another big, yeah, big market that's as right, well. Yeah. Um, but the big kind of like hot spot or hot topic these days is the salmon. For sure. And not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. I know. Unfortunately. Um, it's, it's mind blowing to me because I don't think there are many people that really understand the scale of harvesting salmon or that it is or how um, many products it like it finds its way into everything from like health pills you know fish oil health pills to like salmon dog food has become a, a big trend recently and like yeah. that's all just like farmed salmon just kind of filling the market void and a lot of people really don't even know to look for that difference between wild and farmed and then it's it's a, it's a tough choice too right because a lot of wild stocks are in decline and so you don't really want to purchase or uh, consume too much of the wild fish either, right? But but wild salmon, uh, farm salmon also has a big environmental impact. So, yeah, yeah. And as far as like listing ingredients goes, like do they have to like are there distinctions between like what has to be labeled a certain way based on where it comes from? So in a way, we're kind of lucky in BC um, because. The vast, vast majority of farmed salmon is Atlantic, which is a different species of salmon. And obviously all our wild salmon in BC are Pacific salmon. So your sockeye, chinook, coho, chum, and pink salmon. So if you get in those um, 
species of of Pacific salmon, they're very un, or less likely to be farmed salmon. It's the Atlantic that is mostly farmed. Right. So when you see wild caught Pacific salmon, that's like an Onchiorhynchus species versus an Atlantic salmon, whole different species that's in right. the Atlantic yeah. versus Pacific. Yeah. Interesting. But of course, we do raise Atlantic salmon in the Pacific, which is yeah, I know it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make <laughs> sense. Um, how did so? How did we get here? How did um, where does farming salmon originate from? It, it really started in Norway. Um, the first an open net cage salmon farm um, started, uh, started in 1959. Uh, the brothers of Vic out of Norway, they just basically built some cages out of wood and netting. Um, but they were the first ones to raise salmon in captivity from egg to adult size. Um, yeah, that's not very long ago. No, it's not. And the, the, it's, it's interesting because the, the development of aquaculture in the second half of the, the 20th century is really closely linked to two other um, sort of technological advances. One is the mass production of plastics. Because if you have large infrastructure in the ocean, obviously using metal, there's, you have the corrosion issue. And so plastic made that much cheaper and easier. And th that happened around the 50s, 60s. And then in the 50s, you also had the development of um, dry granular fish feed that you could use in aquaculture production, which made the whole thing a lot easier. Um, and But, it, you know, that that was the first experimental one in, in, in 59, but it wasn't really until the 70s when it really took off in Norway and then kind of spread across the world from there. And where in the world is it most prevalent these days? Because it's salmon, so it, colder water areas. That's right. You're not so, going to find it around the equator. No, so it's temperate areas. I mean, you do have it in areas that don't naturally have salmon, like uh, Chile, um, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. So the southern hemisphere countries that don't have n a native salmon population. I didn't realize Australia had uh, farmed salmon as well. I knew I knew there were some in New Zealand and Chile, but Tasmania is sort of the farming epicenter of of Australia for salmon. Yeah. So did, when you were down there for school, did you see a lot of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I did some of my research on that, which is why I worked on. I'm now working on that at the David Suzuki Foundation. Very cool. Okay, so it's kind of spread all around the world. These temperate areas. That's right. Yeah. And so, like, what are some of the impacts that it has? Like, obviously, the demand for it is because people want to enjoy eating salmon or taking fish pills or feeding their dogs salmon. Like, there's a demand for salmon, and native wild stocks just aren't at the numbers that they used to be. Like, management's been pretty haphazard for the past few decades, and we've seen a lot of the declines. So, And, I mean, if, if you really just look at that, it's it's quite a seductive concept right when when overfishing is such a problem around the world just raising those fish artificially in farms seems like a really logical thing to do but of course if you're then har harming the very wild population you're trying to save by farming fish it all breaks falls apart right um and I guess before we like go into that, like why why Atlantic salmon over Pacific salmon? It's really just um, the ease of raising them. Um, yeah, they're they're easier to raise in in captivity. Is that because Pacific salmon just require like I don't know stronger water, stronger flows? I'm just assuming they're stronger fish. It's just more rugged. <laughs> Maybe that's just <laughs> my bias. The rugged I mean, West Coast you know, fish <laughs> versus these like East Coast fish m meandering up like <laughs> New York State and stuff. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Norway's pretty rugged. <laughs> Norway is. <laughs> rugged, I guess, yeah. Strong strong fjord tidal currents out there. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know the exact details of why the one is easier for farming, but one of the big differences between Atlantic and uh, Pacific salmon is that Atlantic salmon can spawn, spawn multiple times, whereas right. Pacific salmon only spawn once. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in, in Canada, um, salmon aquaculture really started in the 50s as... Uh, hatcheries, right? Enhancement hatcheries. So that was kind of just raising salmon smolts to release into the wild to, you know, to stock lakes or to enhance wild populations for, for commercial fishing and for recreational fishing. So that, and that was really widespread already in the 1950s and across Canada, especially trout, freshwater trout and salmon. Um, the first sort of commercial salmon farm for human consumption started in BC in the 1970s on the Sunshine Coast. And so, that was an open net farm like we see today? Yeah. Okay. But that was actually um, native species, their 
they're raising at that time in the 1970s. And it was all really kind of small company, small scale operations. And it was then really in the 80s that the shift to Atlantic salmon happened and the industry really grew exponentially. And um, then when you get to the 90s, um, it, uh, it changed in a lot of ways because it moved from um, a lot of small companies. It kind of consolidated into these um, big global players that, that really um, uh, run the industry. Um, and it, it's interesting because with that shift in the industry, the, the environmental concerns that we have with salmon farmers, which I think we started this um, this question with, um, has shifted also a little bit, right? Um, for example, one of the big concerns at the very beginning was um, feeding wild fish to salmon to raise them, you know, because it doesn't make sense in terms of nutrient, uh, creating nutrients to feed, uh, to use um, anchovies primarily from South America to then feed salmon here for human consumption. Um, it, 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 it doesn't add nutrients, right? It actually, you, you end up with less nutrients by, by the end of it. Um, and they've actually, to their credit, they've made a lot of progress on replacing uh, fish-based uh, nutrition with like soy protein and those kinds of things and, and canola oil instead of fish oils. Um, so that, that was a really big, big concern at the start. Then also the, just the, the benthic impact, so the impact on the seabed below the farms was, was a really big problem, especially um, from excess feed. So, you know, the feed lands on the bottom, it starts rotting, it depletes oxygen, creating these dead zones under the farms. And that was also something that actually um, through regulation um, got better. But um, the the impacts on wild fish, that's the one thing that they just cannot get a handle on and that is not really getting any better. And so that's really where I think at the start, the, the focus was really all about how can we make this industry more sustainable. And now we've come to a point since the 2000s where we, we've realized actually we cannot eliminate the risks to wild salmon so they just need to come out of the water right um the uh, wild and farm salmon just don't mix right it's funny seeing that progression because that's that seems like so many industries from the 50s like that kind of post-war era mentality where there was all these small farmers small businesses doing things holistically doing things on like local scale familiar with it all and then like conglomerates kind of buying everybody out and you have these big global players that are trying to like make everything streamlined for mass consumption <laughs> for sure i mean yeah. i wouldn't necessarily say that the small scale operation had any less impact on the on the wild fish, but of course, anytime you scale up, you're scaling up the impacts too. So just the the pure growth of it really um, has become has been a huge problem. But so as far as like mechanisms of like these fish farms, they've gotten better in that like they're feeding them better, they're reducing um, certain pollutants in certain way. Like they're they're raising the fish better, but there's still this impact to wild salmon. That's right. And and what is that impact to wild salmon? It's really about pathogen transmission. So the the transmission of parasites, viruses, and bacteria from a farm to wild fish. And I think with the COVID pandemic, really, people have become so familiar with language of transmission and, you know, super spreader events, social distancing, all that stuff. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about salmon farm, right? It's, it's all of these fish at unnaturally high densities in an enclosed space. And so, of course, any parasite or, or virus or bacteria that that uh, arrives at that farm just spreads like a wildfire. And then from there, it, it um, sheds into the surrounding water uh, where wild salmon that migrate past there can pick it up. So it's like you could be the healthiest salmon doing your thing and you're just like walking by a super spreader party going on and you're gonna get it that's pretty much it yeah <laughs> yeah, that's yeah that's broken down into layman covid terms there. essentially yeah, yeah yeah and there's um a whole list of, of uh, pathogens that we're concerned about um the the top three i would say are probably sea lice that you might have heard about uh piscine ortheria virus which is a, a virus that is associated with uh, uh kidney and liver disease in in chinook salmon um, and tenacibaculum, which um, is a bacterium that is quite common on, on uh, farm, salmon farms in BC. And in Atlantic salmon, the, the disease it causes is generally called tenacibaculosis. Um, and in Atlantic salmon, it causes something called mouth rot, 
which are these lesions on the jaw of the fish. Right, and that's what you see photos of a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does it affect? Um, does it affect Pacific salmon the same way with the lesions? We uh, I don't we don't really know that much about how it affects them, but we do know from uh, modeling studies that it is exposure to to this bacterium is is linked to population level impacts on survival probability of wild fish. Um, so exposure reduces survival probability. That's right, and it, it, you know it's it's one of the challenges that you have. Um, when it comes to the impacts of salmon farms on wild salmon, it was really kind of evident in that sentence around probabilities and risk. It's like just the nature of observing things in the ocean is so hard as a marine biologist. Like it's out of sight, right? And so, so knowing what's going on below the surface is really, really difficult. And then you're talking about things like a virus or a bacteria where it doesn't necessarily kill you outright. It might just make you weaker. And so you're less competitive with other salmon. Um, you're more likely to be eaten by a seal or other predator. So, and, and so finding that concrete evidence from like A to B to C, it's really, really difficult. And that's why you have to, to use um, probabilities and risk and stuff. But of course, that is then weaponized by supporters of the industry saying, well, you don't really have any hard evidence, right? But that's just the nature of the, of the, of the beast when you're talking about viral or disease transmission in the ocean. It's, it's very complicated. It is. I mean, and that's kind of that, that, that adage of like death by a thousand cuts or a million cuts, like especially something as threatened as Chinook salmon, you know, like how do you I feel like as a society, we're always kind of looking for like the smoking gun. Like we're looking for the thing that causes it, you know, like the one pill that's going to cure everything. And with these species, it's not just that. I mean, it is things like tanker traffic. It is things like climate change, creating different water flow regimes in the rivers. It's loss of habitat. It is fish farms. There's like all these different things. And that ambiguity makes it really difficult to like, from a policy level to like really create change because there are so many things you could say is potentially causing it. Absolutely. And I mean, it's it's that complex life history of salmon, right? Where there's so many different points of human impact, um, and which makes them so amazing, really, as a species. Um, of course, the answer to that cannot be, well, if we don't know what it is exactly, we don't do anything. It means we have to do everything. Exactly. Everything that's within <laughs> our power that we can do, we have to do. And I mean, climate change is definitely a huge one. And that's that's here, right? That's happening. That's, I mean, we need to make sure that we um, reduce our carbon emissions and meet our climate targets, but that's not going to be helping salmon in the short run. Right. Um, it, it definitely will increase their long-term outcome, but in the short term, there's a lot of other things we have to do, and that is um, habitat spawning, habitat um, restoration, things like river flow, like you said, and salmon farms, removing that risk um, from salmon habitat of, of being infected with these parasites and diseases. Mm -hmm. So the first parasite, the sea lice, is the one that kind of gets everybody's attention because it's, it's, again, like an easy thing to identify as like a problem with and it's farms. pretty graphic and, and yeah. gruesome, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's like a, what is it? It's like a little crustacean. That That's right. And it, it attaches itself to a fish and then feeds off the, the mucus on top of the skin and, and the blood. And so it's, um, for an adult fish, it's actually not, like, it's not nice, I guess. I mean, I, I guess if I was a fish, I wouldn't like it, but <laughs> it's not necessarily lethal. But um, the problem is when you have juvenile uh, salmon infected with fish, because the obviously some species um, don't actually have uh, scales at all when they're juveniles, and others have much weaker scales and skin than, than the adults, of course. And um, then when you have a, a fish infected with sea lice, you have these open sores from where the sea lice are feeding, um, which can then lead to easier um, infection with other diseases. Um, and generally speaking, salmon, especially juveniles that have been infected with sea lice, are slower growing, um, they're uh, less competitive when it comes to feeding, and they're more likely to be picked off by predators because they just they just don't have the same level of uh, physical fitness. I mean, they're weaker. They're Exactly, they're weaker. Um, and... The the th you know sea lions have been around for as long as salmon have been around right they they kind of co co evolved but again what we didn't have is this really high concentration and close proximity and close spaces where the sea lions can just kind of reproduce explosively right like you have in a salmon farm and the other thing is that um, sea lions actually cannot tolerate fresh water um, and so we know. 
I'm guessing oh, most people would know the life history of a salmon, right? They they um, are born in freshwater, they migrate out to sea, they spend a few years out at sea, and then they come back into freshwater as adults to spawn. And so what that means is that if a salmon, an adult salmon is infested with sea lice and it swims up into a river, the sea lice fall off because they can't tolerate the freshwater. And so when you then have the juveniles in the freshwater, th there's no source of lice for them because they drop off bef before the adults get there. And so the, the, the interaction of juvenile and adult salmon in the wild is actually not that uh, frequent. But when you have a salmon farm with adult salmon on the migration route of a juvenile fish, that's where you have all of a sudden you have this artificial interaction between adult and juvenile fish where the sea lice can just spread from one to the other. Right. One of the things that I've heard um, people who like within the industry who are pro like keeping the farms in is that, you know, the fix to this is just to add more antibiotics and things to the water, more um, things that are going to attack and kill those sea lice to keep the Atlantic salmon, farm salmon populations healthier. What's the impact of doing that? Why is that not a valuable solution? Um, uh, the funny thing is it actually was for quite a while. Um, we had this... Um, in in feed treatment called slice, so they're fee, uh, feeding. Um, what, is slice an acronym or something? Or? Uh, it might be. Like it, a it's nickname? a product name essentially for oh, for okay. this specific um, um, drug that was fed to the salmon that made them resi resistance to sea lice, right? And that's why actually sea lice, while it was a big problem elsewhere on the world, um, people. Uh, be, like the industry in BC said, well, we, we don't have this problem because we have slice. It's, everything's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> everything's fine. Everything's fine. But <laughs> <It's> um, <great. laughs> what happened was uh, these sea lice, they, they are very quick to adapt. And so they actually developed resistance to this specific drug. And now it's more or less useless because it doesn't really work anymore. Um, so what the, um, what the industry has now moved to is something that is generally bathing the salmon in in fresh water and like and i don't know it's called a hydrolysis it's basically scrape using water to to scrape off the salmon of the fish uh, the, the lice of the fish you're pressure washing the fish um, yeah more or less you could say yeah. that um Is but, it, do they have to remove the fish from the pens in order to do that because yeah. you can't just yeah, yeah. They, they have a specific vessel where they pump up the fish and then clean them and then put them back um there's a few concerns with that one is that um some sampling by independent scientists has shown that they might be releasing live sea lice back into the water. So it's kind of defeats the purpose, right? You're stripping them off and then just like dumping them in the same area where wild fish are migrating. It's like a temporary cull of the populations before just throwing them right back yeah. into it. Yeah. And w it, would it be possible for the sea lice, like if there were some, could they, like, I don't know how they reproduce, like if their larvae would be on like um, the netting even, like do they have to like sanitize the whole netting before throwing those fish back in or like, w is it still just like throwing them into it back into a dirty Petri dish? That's exactly the problem. And, and when you're looking at um, some of the graphs of sea lice counts on the, on the farmed fish, you see exactly this pattern, right? Like it's, you, you see the, the lice load increasing and then they do a treatment and it drops down and they drop down below that threshold that is legal. legal. And then it stays there for a little bit and jumps right back up. And so you have this constant pattern. And what that means that is that technically they're in compliance of um, the regulation because you know if they go above the threshold, they take management measures to get back below it. But if you're a wild salmon and, and you're swimming along there and you have these peaks, you're still um, exposed to this really high infection pressure. Interesting. Yeah. And the second one you mentioned, the virus, what, what's that virus? So this is a uh, Piscean orthoreovirus. And so that, um, that ha was first detected in BC, I think, in 2011. Um, it came, the very recent uh, genetic research has shown that it did come from, from Norway and was likely brought here with uh, broodstock for salmon farming. Um, and they did a study on farm Chinook that were infected with this uh, virus and they found that it was associated with uh, kidney and liver damage. And uh, the, the industry and um, the, the Department of Fish and Ocean says that the variant we f have here in BC is harmless. It doesn't cause disease, but we also have scientific research that shows otherwise. So it's been a very con contentious issue about even whether this virus causes um, disease or not. But again, if there's a risk, given the state of wild salmon, 
we have to do everything we can to eliminate that risk, right? Mm -hmm. Because salmon are like the foundation species to all these different ecosystems. These ecosystems, so many First Nations cultures, it's just, yeah, I mean, they're... And not just here on the coast, like into the interior, like up the Columbia, the Snake River, like into Idaho, Montana. Absolutely. I, I mean, it's the, the, the reach of salmon and their importance for ecosystems is just incredible. Um, <clears throat> so... So it's like open net fish farms. It's just like exposing wild salmon to these open net fish farms is the issue. What's stopping these companies from uh, putting them on land? You know, big bathtubs, pools, <laughs> get like old pools just full of Atlantic salmon. Well, they can, right? Uh, I mean, it, it is being done. We have a, a, a small scale um, land-based uh, salmon farm in BC. Uh, it, it's uh called Kutera, and it was um, started by the Broughton Nations, um, so uh, First Nations involvement. The The problem with closed containment is that people say it's too expensive, right? But the, the problem with that, with that um, thought is that the only reasons that it's more expensive than open net pens is that industry doesn't pay the ecological cost of raising that farm salmon. Right, it's the environment. It's the people that depend on wild salmon. It's the First Nations who who depend on the salmon harvest who are paying that cost. If they actually had to pay that cost in in dollar values, it would look very different. That it equation would be exponentially more expensive than doing it on land, probably. Yeah, and and that's why the regulator has to step in and and has to say, look, we're not doing this here anymore. You have to either move on land or get out. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, again, like a similar issue with so many of these industries. It's like the externalities aren't considered in like the economic big picture, you know? So that's it's like right. when you look at it and you're like, okay, like we're making this much money. It's like, no, because you're also ignoring all of these other costs that you're not taking into account. Like, and more so like the, the immediate effects to all those things you mentioned, but it's also like the future. It's like the impact of this is like generations deep, you Absolutely. know, like even in forests and stuff where we're noticing like the past 50 to a hundred years of like having fewer salmon to return um, nutrients to those ecosystems, like the trees that are growing up now, the saplings are all weaker. That's going to affect how the forest evolves for the next like 500,000 years. Like yeah. it's these like compounding factors. So it really is like yeah, taking into account like all these different things and realizing that like our impact can't just be simplified based on what you pick and choose or what costs you pick and choose to include in your bottom line. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. So getting the fish farms out is kind of the only real viable solution. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's it's been very clear from the last few decades that they're not going to be able to to control that uh, pathogen transmission from farm to wild fish and so they just they just have no place in in wild fish habitat um and you know we're seeing progress on that i mean the the broughton nations um were really they really spearheaded this movement right and in i think 2017 18 they they occupied some of the salmon farms um as a form of resistance and protest and um they, uh, which resulted in an agreement between uh, the province, the industry, and the nations to develop a, a transition plan. And they had 17 farms in their territory. The first 10 came out um, by 2022, and now the remaining seven are on their way out. So they, they really, they made that happen, right? Through direct action, uh, with support from scientists and, and, and um, activists. So th that was really a huge, I think, watershed moment uh, for salmon farming in BC. Pun intended. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, just um, a few weeks ago, um, it was in the news that the Seashell Nation on the Sunshine Coast um, had decided to, to evict the farms from their territory. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a really um, hopeful sign. And of course, the federal government has committed to transitioning the open net pens out of the water by 2025. But... But yeah, what's that mean? Because that's kind of like a gray area thing too. Mm. Uh, that's a bit of the problem, right? There's been like kind of a back and forth and uh, reinterpreting what that actually means. But uh, I think it's very clear what it has to mean. It means these farms have to come out of the water by 2025. If you know, you know, by the, 2025. So like that's coming up quick. That's it's like a year really and a half. Quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're the. The plan is meant to the plan for that phase out is or transition is meant to come out in June this year. So um, we've been engaging with the government on this, and we're really hoping that they come out with a strong plan that really um, is going to give us hope for the for for the future of wild salmon because the situation is really dire and it's urgent. Mm -hmm. 
is having the backing of these nations to get these fish farms out, like kind of lighting a fire under the government's bum to get them out faster? Um, definitely it helps. And it's uh, fish farming in BC is, is kind of interesting because the, to operate a fish farm, you need both a license to operate from the federal government and you also need a tenure from the provincial government. And the provincial government actually um, committed that after June 22, um, salmon farmers would not get 10 years approved anymore if they didn't have the consent of the First Nations where they're operating. So it's actually like a, a requirement in that case to have the approval of First Nations. But of course, on the flip side to that is you also have um, then um, industry making agreements with First Nations where they op operate. And there is definitely quite a, a few left on, on the coast that, that do have these agreements in place with um, with industry. And even increasing in areas. I know Clayquot Sound, they're, they're bringing some of those fish farms that they've been taking out of the Broughton over there. Yeah, I mean, with a with a shutdown of the, uh, the Broughton Farms and the Discovery Islands, um, industry is looking for, for places to make up for that. And, and Clayquot Sound has definitely been one where we, we've seen um, uh, an increase or at least applications for an increase in biomass um, over the last year. It seems suspicious to me. <laughs> I mean, like, if, if they know that the government has this mandate to get them out in 18 months' time, why would you put up all the effort and energy in bringing them over for, like, it, like is that even, like, one full life cycle of, like, a, of a salmon? Like, it, I mean, it's... It uh, seems like a lot of money, like a big investment to, like, just start it up all over again in a place for a year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say that the industry is not going without a fight. I mean, they, they just once again announced that they're taking them the fisheries minister to court over her decision to uh, remove farms from the Discovery Islands. Um, what's, what's the basis behind that? The, the court challenge? Yeah, like what, what's their argument? Um, it's they're saying that the, the minister um, didn't consult properly, that the decision is unfair. It's almost like when you read the document, it almost sounds like they feel like they're entitled to those licenses just because they've had them for so long. Right. Um, Even though the minister is the one who like decides whether or not you have a license. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's uh, one of the challenges that uh, the minister faces and that we face is that um, DFO scientists are still kind of not acknowledging the overwhelming weight of the evidence of independent science about the risks that um, fish farms face to wild salmon. And so the official official line from DFO science is still that there is no risk which um, I think if you look at non-DFO signs, it's pretty obvious that there is a risk. And why is, why is that? Why do they have that bias? Do they just, does it mean that DFO is going to have to perform their own studies and, and kind of reach that decision on their own independent of independent research? I mean, it's, it's about which science do you look at? How do you interpret, interpret and use uncertainty, right? And, and probability, like, like we spoke about earlier. I mean, one of the challenges is that DFO is both tasked with regulating the industry and promoting it. That is in their mandate. And that, that is really a conflict of interest that has been brought up so many times um, in so many inquiries and by so many commissions, but it just, it doesn't get solved. Um, and so you you have that um, resistance within DFO to to acknowledge the risk that the farms um, pose towards wild salmon. It's such a complicated issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. I mean, the next couple of years are going to be kind of yeah very critical for um, the future of wild salmon in, in in BC and the future of aquaculture. Yeah. So I guess like like why BC? Like, because are there the as far as I know, there aren't really any fish farms in the States, like down in Washington, are there? They had them in Washington, and then they decided by, by um, only well, only a few years ago to, to get them out. Yeah, and that was Oceans and Fisheries, like, in the States, decided to get them out. It's different. There, there the authority is with the, with the state of Washington, but yeah, it was the state of Washington that decided to, to get rid of them. Um, it, was, it was really triggered. They had uh, a mass... Um, escape event when one of their farms um, in Washington State um, 
collapsed and i think 260,000 farmed fish escaped into the wild and that was i think i remember that was, hearing about that that was after a storm or something right yeah. a windstorm and so that was really a big i think turning point for the for the efforts there to get them out of the water so yeah bc is really the only place left on the west coast that still allows open net pin fish farms in our waters i mean and from uh, that perspective it's it's kind of great territory for it because it's like you have all these like nooks and crannies and protected sheltered coves where you have like ocean migration currents going through so it's like it's a great place to do it i understand why they they want it here but yeah i mean that's that's you know salmon farms love the same habitat environment that wild salmon love that's why they don't you know that's funny because i mean very rarely do you see the states being sticklers on issues like this you know like <laughs> usually they're the ones that are just like super lax like uh like pushing it off to the last minute to actually like make any good changes like gun regulations for example <laughs> in bc or like canada seems to be the one who's always like trying to be more forward thinking about these issues mm. but not in this case yeah not in this case definitely we're we're the last holdout and i hope that's going to come to an end soon. And so what sort of stuff are you working on at DSF? Like what, what kind of campaigns are you working on for this? So there's uh, obviously we're providing input to the, the government's uh, own processes. I mean, they have, they have uh, consultations um, on the, on the phase out on the, on the transition plan. What are the goals of the transition plan? What should the timelines be? All that kind of, kind of stuff. So we're providing input to that. We're making sure that our um, supporters are educated. Um, that's a big, big part of it. Um, it's actually one of the challenge with what we've seen in BC is a lot of people think it's done. They're gone, right? Um, because, you know, the government made this commitment to get out, get them out of the water. They hear on the news that the Discovery Islands or the Broughton are shutting down and they think it's done, but it, it's far from done. And um, it's definitely going to gonna require everyone who, who cares about ocean health and wild salmon to BC to, to make sure that we keep pushing um, for the government to, to meet that commitment. It's kind of like, excuse this poor analogy, if you're sick, the doctor prescribes you antibiotics and you take antibiotics for the first two days and you feel better, you're like, oh, amazing. If you stop taking it, you're just going to make it stronger and then it's going to like not actually go away. You have to kind of fulfill your prescription. Like using this like, with the fish farms, <laughs> it's the same thing. It's like, yeah, we like we as a province, as a nation, have started those first steps of removal and everybody thinks it's great and grand and then they stop thinking about it. They stop taking the antibiotics, but it's still like brewing under the surface and it could potentially just come back like sure. harder. So, yeah, I think keeping the conversation going and keeping people engaged and informed about this issue is huge. Yeah. That's why I'm so happy we're talking about this today on your yeah. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's one of the things that, because I spend, I live out in um, Euclid, like on, in the clay quad, just south of the clay quad sound. Um, and yeah, like fish farming is, is still a big thing out there. And we are seeing like a lot, like a lot more has been ramping up. And it just, again, like as someone who's kind of outside of that world, it just seems very suspicious. Like, like what is like what's happening behind closed doors that we maybe the public don't know about if they only have again 18 months left and they're still putting in all this energy and effort and infrastructure into making it happen for what doesn't even seem like it would be like the full life cycle of a of a fish to see a return on it and that's you know that's really the the clear gov message we have to make to government is like it doesn't make sense to allow any kind of ramp up in production or expansion whatever you want to call it when you've committed to get them out of the water, it just doesn't make sense. And so um, they shouldn't be uh, granting those uh, permits and licenses to do that. So I guess like like bigger scale, when we look at like aquaculture and the future of aquaculture in the world, like what's, what's in store for us there? You know, I, I think there's definitely uh, a big potential for sustainable um, shellfish aquaculture. Um, uh, seaweed is another one that's really uh, gaining steam, especially in BC. I mean, we, we mentioned before, it's been big for quite a while in Asia because seaweed is just like a much more staple part of their diet, right? Um, in in BC, it's definitely got, uh, getting quite a bit of interest more for a climate change mitigation perspective. Um, uh, they, they found out uh, only in the last few years that um, you can use seaweed to create um, a cattle feed that actually reduces the, the methane um, emissions from from the cattle farming. Right. I've, I saw a TED talk about that. Yeah. Um, Do you know anything about the mechanism of that or the why and the how? No, uh, you know, I deal in, in fish, not cows. Fair. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking like the kelp, like what makes 
kelp as from like a <laughs> photosynthesizing agent? Like what makes it so much different? Like what does it not contain yeah. that reduces methane emissions? It, yeah, it, it's, I'm not sure. Um, I wish I knew the answer. I should, I should do a little bit more looking into that. Um, but that's definitely, uh, yeah, g- gathering steam in BC. And like with everything that humans do in the marine environment, we have to make sure that we get it right. And especially with seaweed, I think we have to make sure we, do, we don't repeat the mistakes that we made with uh, finfish aquaculture, where it kind of came in here as this like really promising new thing and we just let it explode without really having a robust regulatory regime in place. And so... An understanding of its Understanding impacts. the impact. And, you know, kelp or seaweed aquaculture can have impacts. It can impact the the genetic diversity of um, na- a wild or na- uh, native kelp. Um, you can potentially bring in diseases um, that can impact wild kelp if you're not doing it right. Um, and if you're scaling it up to large scales, there's also a question of um, what's the carrying capacity of an area, right? Because they take up nutrients, and if um, an area isn't rich in nutrients, that can actually prohibit growth in, in the natural biodiversity that's there. Um, those are all things that can be managed, um, but we just have to um, make sure it is managed managed well. And then if it is managed well, I, I do think it can provide um, alternative economic ec- ec- uh, opportunities for some of those remote communities that are depending on uh, open net pinfish farming right now. Mm-hmm. And I know that there is like, you know, massive work going towards like restoring all this, all this sort of like near shore habitat from eelgrass to kelp beds um, that have historically been wiped out with the removal of otters that had urchins come in and now with otter populations coming back. So like there's a, there's a big push for um, more kelp stuff, like more kelp monitoring and figuring out where um, historical kelp beds were and how we can like work at reseeding them. It's just, yeah, it's, it's funny when you, when you're doing it through the guise of like an industry, cause or like some economic return versus just like pure restoration because you're still trying to find a way to profit off of it somehow. And I would say the big difference is that that I, I don't think uh, I would ever support putting a kelp farm on kelp habitat, right? Because you're harvesting annually, so you're right. It's, okay, it's not you're not really allowing the the habitat to to re- reestablish itself and the kelp forest to develop over time. Um, so it's really about. Um, having a kelp farm on most like the soft bottom substrate where you wouldn't naturally have kelp uh, growing, but because you're providing the substrate for the kelp to grow on, you can have a kelp farm there. So you'd put like an anchor or something down? Like it's generally ropes, um, uh, uh, lines of rope in the water where the kelp grows. Um, and yeah, but the, the restoration of, of kelp forest is definitely another big thing, which isn't, it's not necessarily a commercial venture, but it's hugely important um, from a biodiversity and, and a climate perspective for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool seeing this whole industry kind of form and bud because within that, you know, when any kind of new industry gets, gets going, people are like, I don't know, what's the demand? Like, yeah, again, like we're not um, Asia, like where seaweed and kelp isn't part of our like staple diets, but within that there comes innovation. And I know there's like all sorts of like, especially skincare and health stuff mm-hmm. because of like the amount of, uh, uh, was it like collagen and vitamin yep. E? I think yep. in it. I'm not <laughs> entirely yep. sure. There's there's growing lines for that. Um, the cow thing, as you mentioned, I cattle think feed. Ice cream has, if I'm not wrong, I think ice cream has certain compounds from seaweeds in it. Uh, really? Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm pretty I, sure. I know with with vegan cooking because there's there's this um, there's this guy on Instagram. What is his name? Richard Mackin at School Night Vegan. He's he's an amazing vegan chef from the UK, and he uses a lot of um, a lot of these binders that originate from different seaweeds to create things like cheeses, like like a fa- like a vegan mozzarella that gives it like that that gooey yeah, drip. Right, right. It's all things that kind of stem from from yeah, seaweeds. Yeah. I think it's a lot about um, creating a certain type of texture uh, in products. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really tasty. I remember. Um, when I lived in the UK and, and after a surf, I would often just go to the, to the, to the rocks that were exposed after the tide. And like they had the seaweed on it that was dried. So it was really salty because the seawater dried on it and I just kind of ate it like potato chips. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A good, a good uh, seaweed chip is delicious. And For even sure. like some fucus. I noticed there's some fucus <laughs> hanging over here. That's always delicious. Always. <laughs> I've, I've had that like roasted before over a fire. I oh, mean, nice. it's, yeah, it's not, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> it's good. I haven't had that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, just 
one thing that I think we always just need to stress, and we have done that, but that's just so central to this conversation. It's just how important wild salmon are for so many reasons and how easily it can be lost, right? And uh, I always think about um, my childhood growing up in Germany, right? I, I grew up um, on the River Rhine, which is one of the biggest uh, rivers in Europe. And I remember growing up and watching like nature documentaries about the Pacific Northwest and like, you know, those footage of salmon like jumping up the river, swimming upstream, those wild rivers and stuff. And it, I just remember thinking how cool that was. And the, the whole time I had no idea that up until the 1950s, the Rhine River was like the biggest salmon bearing river in Germ in Europe. And then they just got wiped out by the 1950s. And, you know, I grew up there in the in the, in the the 80s and 90s, and I, I didn't even have that memory of it anymore that was passed down, right? Like, people didn't ever talk about that. Um, so it's, it's just really, yeah, we really need to, to um, treasure and cherish the things that we have and, and make sure we protect them. Are there any populations in the Rhine? There's efforts to bring them back, uh, but um, it's it's very very small. Yeah. But like it, the it, native runs have just collapsed, yeah, almost entirely. Yeah. So are they like fish brought in from other rivers that they're trying to establish there? Or? That's what they've been trying to do. And I, I mean, one of the problems is that the the river itself has been altered so much um, because one, one of the main uh, yeah, especially for, since the fifties. Yeah, I mean it's a huge transportation corridor, right, with um, shipping. So yeah. Yeah, and I think like it, salmon are just like the backbone to this entire region, culturally, socially, ecologically. Like they make everything function, and and yeah, it isn't a thing to like easily overlook. Um, and we're just kind of at this point now when like after decades of like sort of unregulated logging and industry and development like on the shorelines and all like you know dredging like all the different things that have impacted salmon we're just kind of at this place now where after not even that long like maybe a decade or two decades of like some pretty solid solid restoration work and work at like trying to bring this back that our numbers are actually starting to like not necessarily come back but not drop as much you know like it's starting to stabilize like it like i I'm optimistic and like I see a potential where like Chinook could potentially come back, maybe not to the numbers they once existed in anytime soon, but like I feel like they're, we're kind of like on the cusp and it's it's like a real kind of like wake up call for society to be like, okay, like we're we're at a potential place where things can get better. Maybe we should exercise just a little bit more caution and thought as to put, like for what we're doing coming forward, you know? Yeah, and you know, I, I definitely think there's signs of hope, and I don't want to squash that at all. But I mean, climate change is going to be scary, and but but that's why and the salmon population, it is it we is have a dark to give bleak. them a fighting chance, right? That, that's what it's all about: is making sure they have a fighting chance to adapt, and uh, having their numbers up so we have good genetic diversity, which gives them a better chance to adapt to changing temperatures. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's what we have to do right now is just making sure that we bring back what we've lost to make sure they can adapt to what's to come. Mm -hmm. And keeping population strong. That, so that's exactly adapt. right. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks so much for, for coming and, and hanging out and chatting with me here. Um, for everybody listening and watching, like where, where could they go to get more information, to get more to get involved, like other petitions that you guys have going? Is there open comment periods happening? Um, the Yeah, um, the the government, as I said, will release their plan in June. So they will likely um, uh, have a, a period of public consultation then. But we also have an ongoing petition on the davidsuzuki.org uh, website, um, uh, just uh, which really just says, look, stop messing around. Stop watering down this com commitment that you've made. Just get them out by 2025. Right. Uh, yeah. And so this open, uh, the open comment period happening in June, what exactly is that for? What are they opening up? So that's when the government is going to release the plan of how they're going to do this transition from open net pens. And it, I don't know what it's going to look like. It might look like, okay, we're going to get them out by 2025, which is what we want to see. It also could be, well, we're going to introduce some stricter regulation and then like over the next 10, 20 years, move to something else, which is not acceptable for us. So we might need a big push again. Yeah. And that's, June. that's exactly like what I'm kind of fearful of when I say like things look suspicious. It's <laughs> like, why? Yeah. Again, why would they be putting those pens in if they're supposed to be out by 2025? Like maybe 
the industry is privy to information that we don't have about them maybe extending that deadline or doing something. So I think that public comment period is a good chance for people to get involved and speak up and, and really make a stand to get them out. For sure. And yeah, we, we definitely can't uh, let our eyes off the ball. Yeah. Um, so as part of this these podcasts, a new thing I'm doing is that every every guest on my show, um, they get to pick and choose a nonprofit of your choice I'm going to make a donation to for for your time for doing this. Um, so do you have a nonprofit that you would like to like to make your donation to? That's amazing. I didn't know you did that. Yeah. I'll have to think about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking small scale, something, yeah, grassroots kind we'll of thing. Well, get back to me on that. Let me know. Yeah. No, I think that's awesome that you're doing that. <laughs> yeah. <thanks. laughs> yeah. Just trying to put uh, the little bit of Patreon money I get to good use and try to keep it all growing from there. So I love that. That's awesome. Cool. Anything else you'd like to add? No, just uh, thank you very much for having me on this uh, blustery Vancouver afternoon. Yeah, it's been a little windy, but not terrible. No, it's, it's nice I'll, to be outside. It yeah, is. Yeah. It is. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. It's great you. chatting with you. Cheers. June is fast approaching, so stay tuned for ways to get involved and speak your voice in that upcoming comment period. I'll be sure to let you all know when that happens through my channels on Instagram and TikTok at Nerdy About Nature. And I'm going to throw some links in the show notes here to Killian's work and some more information on all the David Suzuki Foundation has going on there. So if you have any questions or want to get involved, you can look up those links. So after having some time to think about it, Killian opted to make his donation to Clayquat Action, a nonprofit based on the west coast of Vancouver Island that does a ton of research and activism regarding these very fish farms that we talked about earlier in the Clayquat Sound. You can learn more about them and support their work at clayquataction.org. That's C-L-A-Y-O-Q-U-O-T action.org. These donations to nonprofits of my guest choice is made possible thanks to all of my wonderful Patreon supporters out there who are also solely responsible for supporting this entire Nerdy About Nature project from these podcasts to the videos on YouTube and all over Instagram and TikTok. So if you're enjoying any of that, hopefully all of that, and would like to support future episodes, you can join the Patreon family at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature. All of that money goes towards giving me the stability to continue creating all of this fun educational content that you're enjoying so much. And the more support I have, then the more time and energy I'm able to put into it to make it better and better. And ideally, I'd love to get to a point when I can actually hire a team of people to help with research, writing, editing, all of the various pieces that go into this project and making it what it is. If Patreon isn't for you, it's no worries at all. You can show your support by making a one-time donation or by buying some merch at nerdyaboutnature.com or helping me out by sharing this podcast and those videos around, liking, commenting, doing all that you can to spread this info to more people to keep working for a better future tomorrow. Thanks so much to each of you for tuning into this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned lots, and I'm looking forward to catching you all on the next one. Until then, hope you're able to get outside and enjoy some nature wherever you may be, because it sure is pretty neat out there. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>